so good evening. While we wait for everyone to join us, on behalf of uh, AgriFood Cooperative Spain, we welcome you to this webinar on non-food crops for European marginal areas, which joins uh, to the already extensive series of webinars that our organization has been conducting since May 2020 due to the current situation. This event is framed within uh, Magic and Panacea uh, Horizon 2020 projects um, that uh, Mrs. Zephimia Alexopolo will kindly present us later and aims to share the opportunities that non-food crops can provide in the coming years for bioeconomy, not only among the final users, but also to those related industries and organizations that could support their uptake. After each presentation, we will have the opportunity to formulate questions to the speakers in 10-15 minutes slots and therefore we encourage you to, to use the, the question and answer a button or, or the chat which are available at the bottom of, um, of your screens. We would uh, also like to inform you that this event will be recorded and that the presentations of both um, Ephemia and Berian will be posted on our website and also in Magic and Panacea uh, ones. We would like to um, um, inform you that uh, due to um, some last minute changes, uh, the event will uh, likely um, end a little bit earlier. And uh, we would like to, to thank both uh, Berian and, and Effie, uh, who have agreed to share their experience with us here today. So we would just like to remind them to please uh, adjust to the times that were given to them. Um, and with a further add, I, I think we already have uh, many participants. So I would like to give the floor to Eftimia Alexopolo, uh, who is responsible for Energy Crops Unit in Biomass Department of CRES. And it, she is also coordinator of both MAIC and Panathea projects. She is, yes, she's informed, she informed us that the, her connection was a little bit unstable today, so she won't be using the, the camera. But in this way, we, you will be hopefully uh, be able to better follow her presentation. So if you, whenever you like, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much for uh, organizing this webinar. Thank you very much, Berien, for making this excellent presentation about the work we are doing in MAGIC. My presentation is going to present very briefly what is MAGIC and Panacea, uh, two European projects working on industrial non-food crops. Uh, in MAGIC, we are working on industrial crops uh, as a research and innovation project, while Panacea is what farmers are needing is a thematic network trying to connect with the farmers and to put something in the, into practice. So these two projects are very complementary. The first one is uh, for 54 months, while the second is going to finish in February 2021. Uh, in MAGIC, we are focusing on marginal land as Berian presented, and moreover, we try to include it contaminated land facing uh, problems with heavy metals. What is the main idea of MAGIC? We started from the categorization of the industrial crops. We use the term that is written in the industrial journal, industrial crop journal. So we have oil crops, lignocellulosic, carbohydrate and specialty crops. And we want to cultivate them on marginal land uh, to uh, produce bio-based product and bioenergy. You can see in the bottom what is GRC report, Berien already explained, we're working on marginal land facing natural constraints. So the idea is to cultivate industrial crops, not on the typical agricultural 
area, but to use the surplus marginal land and to produce all, a lot of valuable materials. Of course, we'll always keep in mind that when we grow industrial crops on marginal land, the yields could not be the same. On the other hand, in Panacea, we thought, okay, in Europe, we have some success stories. Uh, wh why these uh, are success story, how we can learn from them, and how we can uh, prepare a thematic network with the farmers uh, in 10 European countries and try to make a roadmap uh, for the non-food crops, how to insert in the European agriculture. So in this project, we have, a, uh, we're trying to see where uh, research is standing, what are the needs of the market and the farmers, how we can bridge them together, and in order to do that, uh, we are planning a lot of events with the farmers, training, national workshop, that all of them facing a lot of problems with COVID. And finally, to create a roadmap on this crop, on these uh, non-food crops. As Berian present in Magic, we have three valuable tools. Uh, if you go in the uh, magic uh, website, you can find in the bottom the maps, the crops and the decision support system, all of them presented very nicely by Iberian. Uh, I just want to say a few words about the magic crops and why we select 37 crops to be, inclu be included in this database. When we started the project, we started from a big list of 68 industrial crops. Uh, we try to see what happened in Europe all of these decades and to see what will be the interesting industrial crops. So we started from them and we select 37 crops that we have evidence that they can be grown somehow on Mars the land. And here, these 37 crops are presented in the magic crops. Uh, that is the database. If you go to our website, this database is not, of course, the final. Uh, we have already uploaded two versions, but the last and most interesting will be the last one, because apart from what we took from the industry, this database will have also information for our project from our trials. And of course, we, then we select the top 20 crops that we do believe that they are most promising to be grown on much the land. And on these crops, we work in, in all work packages and in, these crops are included in the magic decision support system. Which are these crops? Uh, here you can see these 20 crops. You can see which we selected from oil seeds from lignocellulosic and carbohydrate. The lignocellulosic, we further uh, group in three groups, the perennial herbaceous, the fiber crops, and the woody crops. And as you understood, we have 20 crops. On them, we are working in all the field trials, breeding, value chain, sustainability, etc. But moreover, we selected 10 uh, value chains, 10 crops, for a specific use, and we analyzed 10 value chains on miscanthus, switchgrass, camelina, castor, safflower, willow, poplar, industrial hemp, and sorghum. And finally, we included lupinus. Uh, initially, we wanted to have nine value chains, and then we included lupinus because there was a big European project, Libbio, that uh, cultivate lupinus, uh, on marginal land for various industrial application. Although we didn't have other evidence, other uh, reference, we included for this reason because we found very important uh, to have a, a big uh, project on this crop. This is the structure of the magic decision supporting system, how we built it, but Berian uh, presented earlier. I have to say there, here that uh, I think Berian presented that and the next, 
But keep in mind that if you go to the website, you have only the first version, two are going to follow, uh, one soon and the last one at the end of the project. Here is the, the place that we're going, doing the trials. In uh, Magic, we're 25 partners. For team of, of them, they are doing research on the field. We have split three zones, zone one, two, and three. And there you can see which are the partners, which countries, and you can understand what kind of uh, uh, crops uh, uh, trials we are doing. With all of the partners, we are doing long-term trials on perennial crops. Uh, we continue to see what can be the yields when you cultivate, for, for instance, sweet grass more than 15 years. Then we have a group of new uh, field trials uh, based on the 20 selected. Then we have large trials and last but not least, we have pot trials where we are testing the productivity of the selected industrial crops when grown with a, a high percentage on heavy metals. This map was pre prepared by Berean. You can see the places we are located, the partners uh, with the field trials. And I have to present another tool. We don't have it in the website, but actually apart from the three, we have maybe two more. This is uh, the upgrade of uh, another, a tool, bio to match that is a tool that uh, was developed is end to s to biome project. Uh, this project in this project uh, has only lignocellulosic crops, but now BDG that is leading that. Uh, adjusted, trying to adjust this tool and to include also carbohydrate, oil, fiber and specialty crops. And you can see below that we have two demand-driven case studies that we are going to develop this year. In MAGIC we are doing a lot of harvesting trials and we want and we try to attract, uh, to organize demo days to invite farmers to join this demo uh, harvesting. Last year, it was very difficult to do the, uh, the harvesting because of COVID, but you can see that CREA partner tried to do, um, here you can see Camelina harvesting trial in Spain uh, that worked perfectly okay, while in Romania, you can see the graph with the value change of Castor, we had several problems and the main problem we, we, we had, it was we didn't manage to do the, uh, the harvesting manually. We are going to repeat this year because we managed to got six month extension of the project. So we are going to repeat this trial in 2021. Another tool uh, you can find in Panacea project. There, there we have a develop, we develop a Panacea platform, uh, not uh, actually 100% uh, ready, but you can see if you go to the Panacea, you can go there, you can register, you can uh, help us to do the validation of this uh, uh, platform. And here we include all the projects that we found uh, on non-food crops, more than 200 projects, and we included information uh, for, 30, for 29 crops that we identified in Panacea as very interesting for the farmer and they have possibilities to go to the agricultural practice. Uh, so far, we included the project. What the, we faced great problems uh, with the confidentiality issues. Uh, we cannot... Uh, Connect, make uh, absolutely connectable so far this platform, uh, and we did because when we started this project, we have different uh, rules about GDPR. In total, you are, you are going to find 29 description of the crops. Here you can see how it looks. The description for castor bean, uh, a, a lot of things about uh, its cultivation and some graphs, if you click, you can see some graphs also. This is going to be updated 
uh, because the last uh, four months now, we are going to complete everything about Panacea platform. As I mentioned before, for us in both projects, farmers is very important. So for both projects, we're trying uh, to uh, organize a lot of events and to attract farmers to follow us. In uh, MAGIC, uh, it is mainly a research project, but we included training with the farmers and uh, the, uh, visits to the fields. And in some countries, we uh, organize uh, courses with 20, 25 farmers that we're trying to explain everything about what we are doing. In Panacea, we put more, more efforts and we try to repeat that in 10 European countries. And from very beginning, we did a lot of national workshops with the farmers in 10 countries when we tried to uh, present, hear the farmers, uh, get ideas and try to be uh, a, 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 a very interactive uh, workshop when we can give information and take feedback. Uh, all of this uh, were somehow interrupted after last March and uh, now the things they are not as uh, we planned it uh, and because we have a lot of things to do, do virtual and for farmers this is not the best way. Uh, in both projects we promised to um, propose a new focus group in EPAGRI and we pro and actually Spanish COP helped me a lot to do that and we managed uh, at the end of last year to have this focus group that uh, managed to do two uh, remote uh, meetings in 2020. Uh, we had the first in May, the uh, May 2020, uh, the second in October. We are more than 20 members, farmers, scientists, advisories, etc. And we are preparing mini papers, a total number of five mini papers. And uh, we are working as a team to prepare a final report on industrial crops that you can uh, you can take it from the EP Agri website. You can see here where is this industrial crops. You can find more information. Which are the members? You can see their CV and what we are doing. Uh, but before that, I want to say something. For me, it's very important. I think uh, if we want to involve the farmers to have projects like Panacea or, or operational uh, groups at national level. Uh, I have seen all of these years that in some European countries, there are very nice operational groups on industrial or non-food crops in several countries like in Italy, in Spain, in France, I have seen several. Not in my country. In my country, this uh, category is not so very famous, but I think it's very helpful to connect with the farmers because it, there is no sense to do a lot of research without the farmers being uh, able to understand and to see the new ideas. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, with this very complicated slide, I'm trying to, to present you which industrial non-food crops are real near to practice after these two projects I can, starting from 68 crops on the first and um, maybe 100 in Panacea I, we found 10 crops that really uh, very close to the agricultural practice you can see are the crops that underline and we did that because starting from Panacea with 93 crops, in Magic with 67, we put a lot of information from Be Cool, Cosmos, uh, We Can Say, Grace, First to Run, a lot of project BBI. We are sure that Miscanthus, Cardoon, Industrial Hemp, Switchgrass, Camelina, Carinata, Sorghum, Poplar and Willow have high chances to reach the farmers and in some cases they manage to have success stories if you search in Europe on specific places like for instance Camelina in Spain. 
And with the, this uh, slide, I would like to thank you. Thank you very much for your patience. Uh, uh, I'm sorry for the connection and I'm open to questions. Okay, thank you very much, Efi. Uh, don't worry about the connection issue. I think uh, we are all used to this kind of problems, but anyway, we apologize uh, to the attendance. Um, we received a couple of questions. Uh, first one was um, sent by Sergi Palu from the CIA, and uh, he asked uh, why the Cajuler uh, crop was not included among the crops of the Magic Campanacea projects. Uh, uh, Pablo, I didn't hear you well. Okay, so I will read it again, Effie. Uh, let me know if you can hear it now. Why Guayula rubber crop was not included among the crops of the Magic and Panacea ah, project? Because we uh, they con we spent uh, two minutes meetings uh, on that, and uh, in Magic we have a lot of experts on uh, industrial crops, and we discussed it very thoroughly, and we thought uh, that we didn't have the evidence evidence uh, to include it. We trying to do a ranking which crops uh, has the higher chances to be grown successfully on marginal land and that's why we did the selection if you go to the database i think yule is there but we it's not in the top 20 that we from from the first year and thereafter we focus all the efforts uh, maybe i think uh, this question was asked by serge palu that's correct, Effie. Uh, okay, so I'm good. sorry for that, but we didn't find evidence, especially in the South, uh, you, a lot of information or articles, etc., to help us to select the crop. Okay, so I think that question is uh, well answered. Uh, next one was um, about the why the industrial hemp is. Uh, well, they, they say industrial hemp is a crop that everybody is looking on for its promising uses in bioeconomy. But the statistic shows as a slow growing in the areas with this crop. Maybe the market is no interested. I don't think so. I, I am industrial hemp, uh, uh, it was very promising between 2015 not 2014 and 2017-18, I noticed that the last two years the, the trend has changed, but in most European countries, uh, they change everything about the industrial crops and start to become very popular. And at the same time, uh, the farmers, they didn't know how to grow these crops successfully, how to harvest, how to organize the value chains. So we, th we think we uh, totally think that uh, industrial hemp is very valuable. That's why it was selected in uh, Magic. And if you go through, you can see another very interesting project, Grace, that there two crops were selected for, industri for marginal uh, lands in Europe. Uh, one was Miscanthus and the second was industrial hemp. Uh, you can go there. It's a six, five years. A five years project is going to start to end at 2022. Okay, thank you. We have another question um, which says the crops for bioeconomy will be not uh, won't be a full reality if there is not a strong demand from markets. In which area do you have more hopes? Bioenergy, textiles, biochemicals, nutraceutical, bioplastics, or other sector? I, I totally agree. If we don't have the market, we don't have the crop. Uh, definitely, I do believe on bio-based materials. Uh, bioenergy is not um, the most uh, interesting for industrial crops. Uh, about fiber crops, some uh, fiber uh, uses, some years looked very attractive, uh, not lately. Uh, that's why I, I cannot, uh, I can say that chemical interesting is very challenging for the next years. And a lot of things uh, are, are going on there, like in Cosmos project that they are testing uh, Camelina and Crambe. And if you go through all the European projects, 
you can see a lot of interesting about camelina. It, it looks very hot industrial crops for Europe. Thank you, Effie. Uh, well, you got uh, several comments in the answers, uh, questions and answers uh, section. I don't know if you want to, to read them and uh, have uh, to the make first any comments. I think the first is on natural rubber from Serge. Mm -hmm. I know that they are doing a, a national project on a marginal land, but we didn't have a lot of information for other places of uh, Europe. And because Mar Magic is a European project, uh, we're trying to, to select crops have uh, been an European acceptance or interesting at European level. Ah, uh, uh, Peter, uh, is mentioned about enabling project. Yes, I know this project because we try to do a lot of things, uh, some events with Panacea, at least uh, in, in Greece, because we have Greek partner. Uh, it's more general than us. I don't... Uh, and another question from Peter. Uh, yes. And keep in mind, I, I forgot to mention another thing that we are going to have a guide for farmers in Magic about what the experience that we collected for the 20 crops, how they can grow successfully on marginal land. And in Panacea, we are going to uh, finalize a roadmap for the successful uh, implementation of non-food crops in European um, agriculture. Uh, Actually, thematics like Panacea, I said before, are very valuable because they are not doing um, the typical research, but actually they ha help to do a connection between the research and the farmers. Okay, thank you, Effie. Very interesting. Another question uh, that we had, uh, it's uh, beyond the support of a uh, research are there any European policies that support the uptake of the non-food crops? I don't have, I don't think so. We have, I, what is, um, what is, the, can be the operational uh, groups in European countries because all of these operational groups, they help farmers uh, together with their, their research, their researchers to do an application in their countries. I think operational groups, like I mentioned before, they are very valuable, not in all European part, uh, countries, because in some countries they, they are not uh, um, uh, advertised properly, and maybe the farmers, they didn't have uh, understand how valuable can be these groups to them. Uh, but another uh, uh, another uh, very interesting project is Prima that they are doing a lot of research, uh, not a practical research around the Mediterranean, but still um, I think the research project is the major um, policy. Can I add something there, okay. uh, Pablo? Of course. Yes. Uh, regarding uh, policies, I, I think, yes, there there are very limited policies, like in the greening, some countries allow uh, to grow uh, 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 non-food uh, industrial crops in ecological focus areas, but that is in general very limited. Or, um, But uh, I, I just want to share with you that on the 18th of November, uh, uh, a study will be presented uh, that we did for uh, DG uh, Energy uh, on uh, the uh, status of unused and abandoned lands and uh, uh, the policies uh, that uh, target these lands to bring them back into production or to maintain them, uh, to prevent them uh, going out of production. Uh, and uh, there you will get a good overview of the different policies uh, that are now in place and that are also in development and that could target towards, uh, well, have unused lands, which are often uh, overlapping with marginal lands. 
So and and I uh, I can send uh, the the announcement to Pablo and then Pablo you can share it. Of with course. Participants. We will do so. Thank you, uh, Maria. <clears throat> and um, we got. Uh, I think this will be the, the last question, unless uh, there are any others. Um, do you think for Efi? Uh, do you think the farmers uh, will be reluctant to the new crops? The common agricultural policy should support these those new crops. Yes, and I think the farmers, they are very reluctant to do some uh, changes because they want to see what is the, the whole value chain. They want to, to, they need solutions, how to grow, where to sell, what is the price, how is the, the, log the logistic value chain, how they are going to harvest. And the first question the farmers, they ask to us, what is the price and if they need new machinery? And uh, actually, uh, last year I was in the north of Greece and tried to establish a Camenilla field in the marginal land. And the farmers there, I tried to call, uh, I put, uh, organize a study tour with 10 farmers. And the only question is, okay, the, the crop looks fine. What is the price? What I'm going to gain from this? And can I use the machinery that I have right now? This is the, the main question always, the price and the machinery. Because I'm, I'm positive that for some crops like Camelina, that is a cover crop, uh, uh, can be grown in winter, in winter between other crops, that, that is really, really close to agriculture. And uh, very easily in two, three years, we can see a difference. And moreover, for, uh, for on the other hand, industrial hemp, it's very attractive, numerous industrial application is a crop that already is be grown in a larger area than the past in Europe. Okay, so thank you very much, Effie, Alice, uh, Berian, uh, Berian um, Albertson, she's a senior research on land use and integrated environmental assessment at Wageningen University and Research. So please, Varian, if you are ready. Good yes, I will Thank share my screen. Yes, I'm uh, uh, going to give an overview of uh, the mapping that we have done in uh, MAGIC. Uh, we have uh, uh, mapped uh, the marginal lands in Europe and we are in the process of also trying to identify the use of these lands, particularly in relation to lack of use, eh? abandonment. Um, so uh, what I will present is uh, have what is mapped in MAGIC, uh, how we mapped the marginal lands. Uh, I will show the results of that and then further show the characteristics of the marginal lands in relation to location and use. Uh, and I will show you uh, where you can access uh, the MAGIC uh, uh, spatial data uh, and other additional data that we have uh, produced and are still producing in, uh, in the project uh, so that people can interact with the results. Um, well, in MAGIC, um, the, the aim uh, is to identify uh, uh, marginal lands, uh, but uh, that this also, also should support the sustainable best practice options uh, for using these lands, and uh, particularly in relation to industrial crops, which is the focus of the MAGIC project. Um, so uh, given this, uh, it means that we will uh, in the first instance, have focused on the biophysical constraints uh, that are uh, determining uh, the, the marginality of lands. Um, uh, that we have also tried to exclude in our mapping uh, marginal lands that are no longer marginal because they have uh, been improved. Uh, by, uh, uh, have, for example, uh, by uh, uh, putting uh, irrigation systems on it or improving uh, the soil conditions, 
uh, where, where it can be improved and where it also leads to productive agricultural use. So uh, that is also the confirmation that we have. Uh, and we want to avoid indirect land use effects and uh, uh, competition with food. And therefore, we also are uh, trying to uh, uh, characterize the marginal lands in relation to use and lack of use, so uh, abandonment. Uh, and we also pay attention to, uh, to avoiding adverse effects on ecosystem services. And particularly uh, in a project, we of course uh, search for win-win options where industrial crops uh, takes place with at the same time improving uh, ecosystem services delivery. For example, uh, a, a cap capture of carbon in the soil uh, or um, increasing the landscape diversity, which could be positive for, for biodiversity. So these uh, options are also uh, searched for in, in the project. Um, in our approach, uh, we said that uh, we, we first did a review of biophysical factors, um, of course, uh, building on a lot of work uh, that has all already been done. And we ident identified 18 single factors. And in order to, to map these factors uh, together, we grouped them in six clusters of factors, which are adverse uh, climate, excessive wetness, low soil fertility, adverse chemical conditions, poor rooting conditions, adverse terrain conditions. Uh, and we also applied a correction for uh, improvement uh, measures that have been uh, taken and that are confirmed by high productive uh, land use, uh, agricultural land use. Uh, so they, these are corrected for, for these um, land and uh, our focus was on agricultural lands so we said that the have we limit our assessment to a mask that we developed and the mask uh is based on a green land cover and it uh shows us where there has been agriculture uh, agriculture activity between 1990 90 and 2012 so several uh, Korean um additions, green land cover additions. Uh, so it, it also includes uh, lands uh, that were maybe agriculture in 1990, but no longer uh, now. Uh, so, but, so the mask is quite wide. And of course, uh, we um, built on the Joint Research Center work on identifying areas of natural constraints, which is uh, 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 a, a cap a uh, common agricultural uh, category to which uh, payments are already uh, targeted uh, in the cap. So uh, also countries, if they choose to target uh, areas uh, with natural constraints, they have also mapped uh, these areas themselves. Otherwise, they cannot target money to it. Uh, so that is, uh, but we have uh, uh, identified these areas uh, following uh, the um, considerations, uh, the guidelines already developed by the GRC, but we also added our own guidelines to it, uh, have building on, on other work, uh, uh, particularly in relation to land evaluation systems for agronomic suitability. Um, so I'll, I'll just uh, show you uh, the uh, different uh, factors and how they have been mapped. So um, the first uh, uh, criterion was uh, on uh, uh, limitations, uh, climate limitations, and these are determined by low temperature, uh, so uh, and dryness. Uh, low temperature uh, influences uh, the the length of the growing season, uh, and uh, this uh, there is a, a threshold put that uh, if the length of the, the daily average, uh, the length of the growing, the number of days um, uh, are uh, below, uh, above five uh, degrees, then that, that is a, a growing day. And that should be more than 180 days. 
or the, there's also another way of indicating that, and that's the thermal time sum, the, the degree days. And that should be, um, if that's lower than 1500 uh, degree days, then uh, it's marginal. And in relation to uh, dryness, uh, we use the ratio of the annual precipitation to the annual potential evapotranspiration, and that should be uh, below uh, 0.5. Uh, so if you see these uh, factors and then we have mapped them, this is based on Mars uh, data, the uh, growing degree de days below five uh, degrees. And this um, leads to uh, a yes, no map. So the blue spots are the ones that are um, uh, that, that have a too short growing degree uh, uh, days, uh, also the, the mountainous areas. Uh, then you see uh, for the next, uh, it's the, uh, the, uh, the degree days, the T sum, uh, and that leads to uh, this map, which is a bit longer. So you see that uh, also areas in the north of the UK appear and more mountainous areas. And also here in the lower mountains, they start being included as uh, marginal. And then the dryness is mapped uh, with the precipitation to the annual evapotranspiration, and that leads to this map. And together, uh, this is the final uh, factor factors uh, of marginal area based on these uh, three aspects, low temperature and dryness. Uh, so uh, what you see is that in the north and in mountainous areas that is determined more uh, by the, the growing degree days and uh, in the south it's determined more by dryness. So that's the first uh, factor or the group. Uh, then uh, we move to excessive wetness that is determined by excessive soil moisture, poor drainage or limited, limited soil drainage. Um, and uh, that is uh, determined by, uh, for example, the number of days at or above field capacity, and that should uh, be more than 230 days to make it marginal. Uh, uh, heavily waterlogged areas, uh, and that are waterlogged for a significant period of the year, or um, uh, poorly drained soils, uh, so all these factors together determine the second group of factors, and this is the uh, uh, the map that uh, maps these uh, combined factors. Um, uh, this is a, a picture that, uh, that you see more. Yeah, it's actually spread all over Europe, this excessive wetness, but more to the the north and the and uh, the, the, the the west, but also uh, and less, of course, in in the south. Um, then the third uh, group of factors is soil fertility, that is determined by uh, excessive uh, acidity or alkalinity, or very low organic uh, matter level, um, and uh, this is the resulting map uh, how where it occurs. Um, how you see in, in, in Belgium and in, uh, uh, yeah, in, in Spain, uh, it's a large concentration of this uh, limitation also here in the Ebro Valley. Um, and then we have uh, the, the fourth group that is adverse chemical soil properties that is determined by salinity, uh, sodicity, uh, uh, toxicity, uh, uh, with uh, natural and with uh, human-induced uh, pollutants. Um, and uh, this is the resulting map. This does not add very large areas uh, to uh, the marginal lands, but it is it does add the very specific uh, regions where this, this occurs. Um, and uh, then uh, we have the poor uh, rooting conditions, and that is actually a very big group uh, because um, 
uh, the, uh, the there are several sub factors that determine that make up this this group. Uh, yeah, so there are um, th there are several factors that limit the rooting conditions uh, in the land, uh, like stones, but also uh, very heavy organic soils, or very clay heavy clay soils, or uh, impeding layers. Uh, across fragments uh, or surface or uh, stones or rocks. And um, that, um, uh, uh, yes, and then, uh, uh, yeah, is also within this uh, group, uh, the, the, these two sub factors also are uh, uh, included. So it's a very wide group. Uh, also, unfavorable uh, texture and stoniness and shallow rooting depth. Uh, and all these factors together are mapped here, uh, uh, where you see the red areas are. Uh, so you see that this uh, really is a very important uh, uh, clustered factor that determines a lot of, uh, of the marginality conditions in, uh, in Europe. Um, and then the last uh, cluster uh, uh, of factors is adverse terrain conditions, and that is determined, of course, by steep slope, but also by flooding risk. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and the map that shows uh, this situation uh, is uh, presented here. Um, uh, so what we have done is, so we have these six uh, clusters of factors and they have been combined uh, in uh, one uh, map. And that is what you see here. The left uh, map uh, is the result of the mapping of all these marginal conditions combined. Uh, but uh, then, uh, as I told you before, uh, we said, well, uh, in areas where there has been an improvement, uh, where the, actually the, the, the marginal condition has been neutralized by uh, human uh, uh, by measures like irrigation or improvement of the soil conditions, uh, particularly uh, uh, soil fertility, for example. Uh, then, uh, uh, so this takes away, this correction takes away uh, uh, marginal land that has been mapped on the left hand. Uh, and uh, you see, uh, for example, in France, there is a, a, a much lower amount of marginal land because of improvements. Uh, also several parts of, of Belgium and the Netherlands. Uh, in Spain, you see that the yeah there is some correction, but uh, it's it's more limited than in in, in uh, the northwestern western uh, countries. Um, so now um, uh, now uh, this is an overview of which um, uh, factors are most important. Uh, so you have we have classified uh, that. Uh, according to uh, the environmental zones of Europe and uh, northern zone, uh, the Atlantic, which is this part, uh, and um, and also uh, the Alpine, continental, and the Mediterranean. And uh, what you see actually is that at first routing conditions, um, they have been uh, they they are the the, the most important. Uh, practically in in all uh, to, uh, yeah uh, in in all uh, the environmental zones in combination with uh, adverse climate uh, adverse climate for example in the alpine zone not surprising is of course very influential uh, while it is of low influence in the continental uh, and in the Mediterranean there is a large influence and also in the north. Uh, but um, uh, yes, so it's uh, and what you see uh, also is that uh, overall, uh, so if we would not um, uh, uh, make a, a, um, a reparation, uh, so if we would not exclude the improved lands, then uh, 
well, the, the average amount of marginal lands uh, would be uh, a bit higher, 35% uh, in the north. And after imp uh, excluding the improved lands, it uh, becomes 27. Uh, and the Atlantic, uh, yeah, it's uh, the influence is also, um, yeah, uh, is large, but in the Alpine uh, region, it doesn't make a big difference. Um, and then uh, in total, uh, for the whole of Europe, uh, we see that 29% of the agricultural land uh, is uh, marginal. Um, the most common are rooting limitations and adverse climate and excessive soil moisture. And the largest sh share of marginal lands is defined by one of the six cluster limitations, while in a much smaller share, multiple limitations occur. Uh, I'll show that uh, here. Uh, you see that um, had uh, these gray um, cells uh, uh, are the shares uh, and the, the percentage of marginal lands uh, that uh, uh, is only uh, having one uh, limitation. Uh, so the majority general in, in general, you see that adverse climate uh, is a single factor in 12% of the all marginal lands, uh, but it often occurs in combination with limitations in routing. Um, excessive wetness occurs uh, often in combination with adverse climate. Um, chemical composition is a very small uh, limitation in area coverage, and it is always a single uh, limitation. It does not occur uh, practically not in, in combination with other uh, marginal uh, limitations. Uh, the same applies to low, low uh, well, low soil fertility, 7% in total. It often occurs with adverse uh, climate, but it's not a big group. Uh, and limitation routing occur in a single factor for 90% of the marginal lands and often in combination with the uh, first climate and excessive wetness. Um, so uh, that is the um, total results. And now I, I just give some examples. Here we see uh, three uh, areas uh, in Europe, uh, which are uh, unique in that they uh, have uh, quite a, a strong combination of different uh, marginality conditions coming together. For example, uh, we see that uh, in Scotland, where you have excessive wetness, climate limitations, and limitations in routing all coming together. Uh, in Hungary, uh, you see uh, multiple limitations in relation to salinity, fertility, excessive wetness, and routing limitations. And also here in the Ebro uh, Valley in Spain, uh, you have a large concentration of multiple overlapping limitations even all the six factors coming together uh, in, in uh, overlapping. Uh, that is the most complex uh, marginal land situation in the Ebro uh, Valley. And uh, what we also did was that we evaluated uh, the results um, uh, in, in uh, uh, 18 sites um, using um, uh, uh, Google Street View uh, data um, just to understand better uh, whether the correction that we applied is indeed uh, uh, working well. Uh, uh, for example, here you see uh, the Ebro uh, Valley and uh, this is the, the left hand is the map of uh, marginal lands um, before we corrected for improvements. Uh, and uh, in, uh, in the point A, you have the limitation of salinity, fertility, and rooting limitations. Uh, well, in area B, um, you have only the dryness that determines uh, the limitation there. And we have corrected there because we uh, had information about 
uh, the occurrence of uh, irrigation, active irrigation. And so we took uh, that uh, limitation uh, away in the co uh, correction and uh, uh, the Google Street flu View uh, um, indeed uh, confirms uh, that this is very intensively irrigated area. And so we have done these evaluations uh, uh, for um, uh, in 18 sites. And furthermore, we have also visited, uh, done many field visits uh, in Spain, especially um, uh, to validate what, uh, what we have uh, mapped. Um, now I want to talk about the characteristics of the marginal lands uh, in relation to location and use. Um, well, first of all, uh, we overlaid uh, the marginal lands uh, with uh, where uh, the rural, deep rural, peri-urban and urban areas are. And not surprisingly, 14% uh, of the 14% uh, of the 27% is uh, located in deep rural areas and 11% in rural areas. And so the large majority of all marginal area uh, is concentrated in the rural areas, which is not a surprising result. Um, what we also see, uh, this is um, the overlay of the marginal area with the different uh, Korean land cover agricultural classes. Uh, and uh, we see uh, that the percentage of, of marginal, uh, of marginal, uh, so the, the, the largest percentage of marginal lands is located in non-irrigated arable land. Uh, that is also, uh, so that is a large amount, uh, which is not a surprise because non-irrigated arable land is a very large land class. But if you look at the percentage of the non-irrigated arable land that is marginal, then it's only 18%. Uh, for pastures, uh, uh, you see that, well, almost one third of the pastures are marginal. Um, and that makes up 17% of the total marginal land and Morrison Heathland. And the majority of Morrison Heathland not surprisingly is marginal also uh, natural grasslands also large majority is marginal and it makes up 11 percent uh, so and um, yeah and then less important uh, larger uh, uh, land cover classes uh, have a smaller uh, part in the total marginal uh, cover um, now I want to discuss a bit more uh, the, uh, the use uh, of these lands. A very interesting study was done by our colleagues from CIEMAT, uh, looking at uh, what the yields are uh, in marginal uh, arable lands, uh, non-irrigated arable lands in Spain. Uh, so they overlaid um, uh, the, the marginal conditions with uh, 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 detailed uh, yield information. And what they uh, saw was that um, and the, a, a very, uh, that in most of these uh, arable marginal areas, the yield levels are not reaching uh, more than 1500 kilograms per hectare. And that is actually the uh, the, um, the the turning point uh, at which a farmer can still get a, a positive return from his uh, uh, product. Uh, so uh, and the only way uh, to to keep on managing uh, producing at this low level of yield is currently because there is some cap payments that make uh, the balance positive, uh, but fifteen hundred kilograms is is really the actually the the, the maximum that you can handle. Um, often you see that these systems have a um, uh, they produce uh, cereals every two or or every uh, three years, and there is a much uh, fallow um, uh, 
fellow applications in between. Uh, but for economic, uh, economic returns are, are, are very low on these lands. Uh, and this is also a reason why many of these lands uh, are becoming uh, abandoned uh, or uh, are often, you can also call them uh, semi-abandoned. Um, uh, so here, for, uh, and that brings us to, uh, to uh, our next uh, assessment in uh, MAGIC, and that is that we also want to understand what is uh, the, uh, the current use in these marginal lands. Are they all used, uh, or what is the, the level of abandonment for these, uh, for these lands? And in that, we follow uh, the uh, red two uh, criteria that define unused and abandoned lands. Both uh, these categories are, um, uh, they, uh, red says uh, some land is unused or abandoned if it's unused for at least uh, five consecutive uh, years. Um, and that applies to unused lands and abandoned lands, but abandoned lands have really um, the reason uh, uh, that uh, abandonment takes place is usually due to biophysical or, or socioeconomic constraints. And here you see a couple of pictures of uh, the lands um, uh, that are abandoned. Uh, we, we have done field uh, uh, field research uh, in relation to that. Uh, and so here you see uh, land that is has been unused uh, in Albacete for more than five years. And then you see in the middle a picture of land that is uh, unused for three to five years. So that would not be part of the red two category. And then right to the right, you see a clearly uh, unused land that has been well uh, unused for, for at least 10 years. Uh, and we want to uh, detect uh, these areas, uh, but uh, the problem is that there's not really good data on uh, unused uh, or abandonment status of, of lands, and uh, not in agricultural statistics. What would we do see is that in the uh, land use parcel information system, uh, in which uh, farmers need to register uh, their crops, uh, for obtaining uh, common agricultural policy payment, uh, that they do uh, register now and then um, uh, whether a parcel is used uh, or unused uh, for uh, a couple of years. Um, uh, these data are not really always uh, accessible. We uh, luckily, well, in, in certain countries, they are well accessible, uh, in Spain, for example, and that is also very lucky for us that we can work with these LPs data to develop our methodology to detect unused lands. But for example, we have experienced that in uh, Italy, uh, it is very difficult to get these data for certain regions. Some regions do uh, provide the data. Um, so that, that is a bit of a, of a challenge. And what the biggest challenge is, is that if land become unused for uh, usually more than five years, then they also completely disappear from er uh, any registry. Uh, so they are no longer in ELPIS and they are no longer in other agricultural statistics. And so uh, you cannot really follow uh, the fate of that, that land because it's no longer registered. So in MAGIC, we are developing a methodology to detect these unused lands uh, through high resolution remote sensing data and radar data. And uh, with radar data particularly, uh, we have been most effective until now. Uh, we have developed a, a indicator, uh, which is radar coherence. And it, that indicates, it's an indicator for whether an object has changed between two images, radar images. Uh, so, for example, buildings have a high coherence because they do not change in time. And vegetation have a low coherence because they, they uh, grow and um, move with the wind. So there is a lot of change. Um, so what, what the, uh, it enables us 
is uh, to detect uh, whether there is management uh, and a, a crop growing in a field and whether there's management activity in the field. Then the coherence is very low. Um, so this is an example. Here you see on the left hand side a coherence time series uh, for intensively used fields. So you see that there is a lot of the, uh, you know, low coherence, uh, extreme extremes in coherence, jumping up and down. Well, uh, if you have a field that with little activity, that's on the on the, the two right hand pictures, uh, they show a, a high coherence and no extreme differences in the in the coherence levels. Um, well, uh, it, it's a quite technical uh, uh, explanation. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to give all the details, but I'm, I'm just going to show you that we have for, uh, for at least uh, for the region of Albacete in Spain, we have been quite um, uh, successful in identifying unused lands with the radar coherence information. Uh, and here you see, for example, we have the ELPIS data and they confirm that there's uh, 3.47 percent of the parcels, arable parcels, are unused, and the radar detected uh, well a, a percentage that comes very near to that. And then we also did the validations um, of the points that we classified uh, as uh, unused or fallow, and uh, the uh, Google Street View confirmed that 75 percent of the points were classified correctly and the other 25 points we, we we did not know because we did not have the street view data available uh, so uh, for the other 25 percent well we we have no confirmation whether it was correctly uh, classified or not but uh, we suspect that um, yeah that, that it, it it was pretty correct uh, in most cases so we have developed this uh, methodology and we are now extending it to uh, other regions uh, uh, in, the, in the EU. Now the last um, uh, thing I want to share with you uh, is the decision support tool of MAGIC, the MAGIC uh, maps. If you go to the MAGIC website and you scroll down, uh, you see uh, these uh, three uh, options uh, you can click on. You can click on Magic Maps, ma Magic Crops, and Magic DSS. The data uh, that you can now see uh, in these um, in this DSS are intermediate uh, data for the project, but they are already accessible. Um, well, for Magic Maps, uh, if you click on that, you will uh, see this map. Uh, and this map shows you uh, the uh, percentage of uh, marginal lands mapped uh, in the different regions uh, of the EU. Uh, we have also included Ukraine, but that's not included yet. But in the next version, you can also access that one, uh, that part of uh, Europe. Um, and uh, if you click on a region, then, uh, for example, here, uh, you, uh, uh, region in Spain, Huesca, uh, it tells you uh, how many uh, square kilometers of the different uh, marginal, marginal conditions occur in that region. And um, if you scroll down uh, in this uh, um, view, uh, then you can also uh, see uh, the different crops that are suitable uh, to be grown uh, in uh, this region. Uh, so, and these are the crops that we are uh, reviewing uh, in the MAGIC uh, project. They are crops that are adapted to uh, marginal conditions. And the suitability that we are expressing here uh, is uh, based on a mapping of the climatic suitability of these crops so far. Um, yeah, you can also uh, go to the MAGIC DSS, the Decision Support uh, System, 
And that system uh, tells you more uh, about, uh, you can scroll to different areas. Uh, it tells you more about uh, what type of uh, marginal conditions occur and also the type of crops that can grow in the different countries. Uh, and you can click, for, for example, hey, here you see uh, the uh, amount of uh, marginal land uh, by country in square kilometers. And by far, Spain is really dominating this uh, group. Um, hey, here's Italy, here's France. Uh, this is absolute figures. Uh, you can also click on the type of crops that are suitable for the area that you have selected. Um, and then uh, the last uh, thing is that you can also enter an uh, interactive database that gives you more details about the different crops uh, that are uh, assessed uh, in, uh, in the MAGIC project. Uh, oh yeah, what I also wanted to tell you is that this information is now on a quite large not two not three regional level but we are um, preparing a version that enables you to uh, to obtain data at the municipal level at the higher spatial uh, detail and that should be available uh, by uh, december or january uh, at the latest uh, and then people can really um, zoom in uh, and look at the marginal conditions in uh, in the municipality that they uh, that they know um, so that is uh, my presentation um, uh, it's now time for for questions yes Effie thank you very much for your great presentation um, Indeed, uh, we, we received uh, three questions in the chat. Um, I think you can read them, but I, I will uh, launch them for you as well. So the first one is referred, uh, uh, is trying to inquire if you already served these results with uh, any European institutions such as the JRC or the DGI Agri. And if uh, in this case, uh, what is the feedback that you got about the re re reliability of the of your approach? The reliability. Exactly. Sorry. Um, yeah. Um, well, um, what what is a challenge uh, in our project is that you have to map. Uh, these marginal conditions according to the spatial data that are available and the resolution of that data is not always um, perfect right so you have uh, uh, information you rely a lot on the soil um, mapping units which can be quite large areas uh, and uh, how we, we we have good data in Europe for this, but it's never optimal. So what, what happens is that if we provide this data at grid level, for example, at a, uh, I don't know, 500 by 500 meters grid, then if people zoom, zoom in in the data, then uh, they say, hey, but I have a marginal field and it doesn't show on, my, uh, on the data that we have mapped. Yeah, because the, the resolution of the input data is is not always as detailed as, as you would like to have it so it's better to interpret these data at a level like for example a municipality level eh? so it shows you more in this municipality or or, or, or region app province you have a large concentration of marginal land uh, that is reliable, but uh, at checking it at, at the field is sometimes a bit uh, looking at, at really per field at the data. That's that's not reliable, I would say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that already solves one of my questions. Uh, Peter Parry uh, has uh, also shared a question uh, and I will read it for you which is, uh, can you connect economic 
perspective to marginal conditions? Is there a special uh, crop that could be grown only there? And he, he says, for instance, drought resistant. Yes, well, I think uh, Evi can explain a lot about that, but we are investigating several crops that are quite uh, uh, drought resistant and uh, water efficient. Uh, so, and that's exactly what we, we're doing in the project, that we, we, we try to indicate which crops can cope best with which uh, marginal conditions uh, in every region. That's the, the whole idea of the project. And there's also uh, further uh, uh, economic assessments done at the performance of the of the crop in a specific location. Uh, so uh, there there will be. Yeah, Evie, do you want yeah, to? Do you want to say something on that? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I will explain in my presentation that in Magic we selected 20 crops, and for them we are doing economic and environmental analysis and sustainability. And moreover, we selected 10 crops that we are going to uh, analyze the value chains. That means economic, cultivation, of course, sustainability, everything. But uh, we are in the last year of the project that is the most critical for us. And actually, all the results are going to be, um, uh, uh, be uh, um, available this at the end of 2021. Actually, a lot of things are going on right now because in Magic we started with the maps with variants, uh, especially the last two years, and all the things uh, are uh, like crops, economic analysis, and everything starting from uh, later on. Thank you very much, Effie. We are glad to have you back with this uh, wonderful quality audio. <laughs> <laughs> I changed house. <laughs> okay, so next question for, for Berlin, uh, they sent us, is uh, do you think this, this mapping could be used for official purposes, including using common agricultural policy, uh, for instance, for allocation of uh, specific aids to areas uh, with constraints? Uh, yes, uh, I think so. I think... Um... Because uh, currently, um, uh, yes, not all uh, country, countries have have a choice uh, to address uh, certain cap payments to areas of natural constraints, uh, and you see that um, yeah, uh, several countries make use of that, but not all, uh, and th th this uh, mapping uh, will show at least. Uh, how much uh, uh, um, marginal lands are uh, located in different regions and the type of marginal conditions. Uh, so uh, it, it makes, uh, I think it's, it's a very good start to assess whether it makes sense to, uh, to, to address certain payments to uh, areas of natural constraints and, and also to, to understand better uh, which constraints need to be uh, are, are most influential in in every location? Yeah, but usually, uh, of course, uh, the countries themselves have to then further uh, improve the mapping of uh, the areas with natural constraints according to also national uh, data sources. Uh, so and and yeah. Uh, they can take this as a basis and see where they can improve. Um, yeah, so I think it is a, a good source of information for cap payments. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think the, the last uh, question, because we need to move forward with Effie's presentation, uh, it's a um, Regarding the, that, um, the maps that have been created in the MAGIC project, if they will, will be available for public use, uh, and uh, they gave us an example, for example, if you can uh, download the file with the maps of European problems for stoniness or wetland, uh, 
so we can integrate uh, this information in a geographical information system. Um, so the question is, so can it, yes, well, how it works now is that the, the uh, decision support system uh, does not enable you to download the data, uh, not yet, uh, but we have to um, uh, discuss how we make uh, data available at the end of the project. For sure, uh, uh, people can always contact us and then we can, can share the data with any person who wants to work with the data, no problem, as long as they refer well uh, to, to the MAGIC project as the source. Uh, so that is, uh, it's, it's open data produced in a European project, uh, but we will only start sharing the data at the end of the project when we are, uh, when we have a, a completely described it and quality, quality checked uh, the data. Yeah. Okay, very good. So thank you very, very much for your presentation and answering all these questions. So uh, as uh, I announced at the beginning, we are going to finish a little bit earlier. Um, we want to, to thank you all for joining us to this, this event, which we hope has been of your interest. And also, of course, thank you again, uh, Mary and Ephthemia who have illustrated uh, us with their great presentations. Um, we remind you once again that the files of the presentations will be shared at both Magic and Pathia project websites. And uh, we hope to, to see you soon in our next events. So thank you all and have a good evening. Thank you very much for everything. Goodbye. Goodbye.